Good morning and welcome to the public part of the Rural Economy and Connectivities Committee's 26th meet, meeting in 2018. Could I ask everyone please to make sure their mobile phones are on silent. Apologies have been received from uh, Stuart Stevenson who is attending another committee at this stage. Um, and John Finney will have to be leaving the committee part way through. We will go straight on to agenda item two, which is a decision on taking business in private. The committee is asked to consider taking three items in private. Firstly, item five, which is a draft letter on pre-budget scrutiny. Secondly, a future consideration of its draft approach to the restricted roads um, uh, Scotland Bill. And thirdly, its future consideration of its draft approach to the anticipated South of Scotland Enterprise Agency Bill. Are all members agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, we are going to move on to agenda item three, which is the Transport Scotland Bill. Uh, I wondered if there are any members want to declare any interests in relation to transport. No? Perfect. So this is our fourth evidence session on the Transport Scotland Bill, focusing on low emission zones. This session will also touch on the parking prohibition provisions in the bill. Can I welcome Martin Reid, the Policy Director of the Road Haulage Association, uh, Gavin Thompson, the Air Pollution Campaigner at Friends of the Earth Scotland, representing the Scottish Environmental Link, Ton, uh, Tony Kenmuir, Treasurer and Member of the Executive Committee of the Scottish Taxi Federation, and Neil Gregg, the Policy and Research Director of I Am Road Smart. Um, there are a series of questions. Can I just say, for those of you that have, have given evidence before, uh, you will know that uh, if you want to answer a question, you need to catch my eye so I can bring you in. You please do not need to touch the buttons in front of you. The, uh, gentleman on your left will automatically activate the, the speaker in front of you. And if you see me waving my pen like this, that probably means I'm trying to encourage you to, uh, to, to wind up what you're saying. It saves me having to cut you off. Um, so welcome to the committee. And the first question the, this morning is from John Finney. John. Thank you, Kavina. Hey, good morning, panel. Um, there's a number of perhaps slightly more technical questions to come. So I'm going to kick off by uh, rolling a couple of general ones together, please. And that is about the, your position on the principle of establishing LEZs in Scotland and what in impact, if any, you think they will have on reducing air pollution at recognised uh, hotspots, please. Do you want to start on that? Sure. Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me OK? Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, so I'm the air pollution campaigner at Friends of the Earth Scotland, and the transport bill could offer a great opportunity to reduce air pollution, not just through low emission zones, but through the rest of the bill as well. Um, low emission zones are used across Europe as a great way of reducing air pollution, which primarily comes from traffic. Um, we know the, the health evidence from air pollution. There's fresh stories every week that are alarming. Um, we know it shortens lives, it damages hearts and lungs. The most recent stories we learned it impairs cognitive ability, uh, increases the risk of dementia, um, it can reach unborn babies through the placenta. So it's clear we need to be taking action. Low emission zones are one tool to um, improving air, air quality. Um, the provisions as they are in the transport bill, certainly need to be improved to ensure that we protect people's health. But that is possible if, the, um, if certain changes are made. And I think a helpful lens uh, as we analyse the provisions in the bill and as we um, discuss it this morning is that fundamentally we're looking at a public health policy. As you said, it involves a lot of um, detailed traffic regulation. But what we're looking at is something that when it's implemented effectively should protect people's health else want to come in on, on Tony? Thank you. <clears throat> I think we're, we're, we're all agreed that we want our descendants to breathe cleaner air. I, I, I shouldn't think anybody debates that. Um, and um, also that we're moving towards um, cleaner vehicles, Euro 6 standards. Um, and it strikes us from the, um, from the report that we're, um, we're discussing today. Um, I'd like to just very briefly use a quick analogy. 
if you find yourself in a motor car with dual climate control in the front, and I as a driver want to keep cool and I set my temperature at 15 degrees, and my passenger on the other side of the gear stick wants to be warm and sets their temperature at 25 degrees, neither of us are going to achieve what we want. Um, and, uh, and I think that my, the, the slight concern I have about the, the low emission zone approach um, is that if we improve the standard of our vehicles of our fleet across the board, that's perfectly logical and reasonable. Why we would do it only in certain streets or within a certain area, that's the bit that I struggle with when it's surrounded by... <laughs> uh, maybe every step maybe is, a, is a one step in the right direction, but um, the, the, I must admit that to us the, the, the concept of a low emission zone, of only controlling the emissions in certain streets, doesn't seem particularly logical as a principle. And even within your own report, the findings across Europe and in London in the low emission zones are that the, the lowering of emissions, frankly, doesn't amount to much. Martin, do you want to come in on, on low emission zones and, and the road haulage industry? Yeah, sure. Um, again, thank you very much for the opportunity this morning. Um, low emission zones are clearly um, the way forward in terms of, I mean, this is, this is the direction of travel that we are, we are all going in. Um, for our industry, uh, I have not heard of any specific objection to the concept or the principle of a low emission zone. Our concern is the time frames that are maybe being mentioned about that and our industry, uh, our ability as an industry and the technology that surrounds our industry to accommodate those changes at the pace. Um, so, uh, as Tony rightly says, everybody has the right to clean air uh, and the road haulage industry feels no different about that. Neil, as, as everyone else has had a chance, it would be right for you to come in as well. Just a quick point. Um, we, most of what I'll be saying today is based on a survey we did of 1,400 of our members. We have 92,000 members. Um, and and the, one of the most striking findings was that only 3% had any confidence that anything that any government did would solve the problem quickly. And a lot of this, the, the questions we asked people were fairly evenly split, a third in favour, a third against, a third don't know. And it's that big don't know. It's, there's a real lack of consumer information out there to allow people to make a judgment now. And I think that's why the people are, are sometimes slightly worried about this, because they just don't know what it actually means yet. Uh, so I think from our point of view, the key issue is consumer information, getting that out there and helping people understand what these policies actually mean to them. John. Do you want to... Thank you. Well, uh... Um, the, the, the important thing of taking evidence is to shape this. We are, the committee's job is to, to scrutinise. So, I mean, it's good that there is consensus, at least that, the, that uh, from my point of view, it's good that there's consensus that there's a wish to see low emission zones. Mr Thompson, you think that a, a lack of ambition, perhaps, connected with a... Yeah, um, a lack of ambition. Um, the objectives of a low emission zone, what specifically would... Um, would the low emission zones be trying to achieve has not been set out in the bill, which is a concern, particularly when we look at the delegation of powers between ministers and local authorities, that lack of object, um, objectives <coughs> could cause problems. And the, an excessively slow implementation period, at long grace periods, which mean that um, in the current version of the bill, low emission zones wouldn't be in place until perhaps 2026. So that seems for, for an issue that we can all agree is essential that we need to act on and is imperative for human health. That seems um, unnecessarily slow and something that we, we could perhaps look at and the emission restriction standards. Just to make a, a, a broader point that we know most of our air pollution comes from traffic and essentially we need to be reducing the air pollution that we receive um, from private car travel. So that's about modal shift and a change in types of cars. Um, and the provisions that are in the, the current draft of the bill don't fill me with confidence that um, it, they would be successful in, in reducing our air pollution. Um, our situation is slightly different from that. I mean, we're not going to argue any about, about the health benefits or disbenefits. That, that's, we're, we're not experts in that particular area. Um, and we we'll happily defer to those who are. Um, our, our position is, is one of a current reality. Um, we have no current retrofit option uh, for trucks to, uh, for the, to come up to Euro 6 standard. Now, buses have it, 
Um, I, I will add a caveat, which is that uh, late last night, um, while I was preparing and, and not sleeping, uh, as I should have been, uh, I read an article that there has been a successful trial uh, by a, a waste, a, a large waste management company, uh, using a, 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 C, a CVRAS approved retrofit option. So it may be that we're now on the cusp of something good happening in that area, uh, which we would, all, we would cross our fingers and hope that that is the case. But up to this point, we have no retrofit option. So the option for our industry is to remove or get rid of the truck they currently have to buy a Euro 6 engine truck. Now, that's problematic, particularly for SMEs. Um, a, a, a Euro 6 truck could cost anything between 80 and 120,000 pounds. Uh, the re reality, again, is that the popularity of uh, the, the Euro 6, mainly because through legislation, etc., has created a distortion of the second-hand value of Euro 5. So the gaps and the barrier for entry for those who are willing to or are wishing to adopt this newer technology, the barriers have got greater. So. In terms, for, for our industry, um, 2023 does not seem a long way away. Um, I, I totally understand the point that, that Gavin's making, but the reality for our industry is that should there be a situation where we are required or forced to jump uh, early, technology is not backing us to do that, uh, and neither are the economics just yet. Uh, the Euro 6, the, the, the percentage of Euro 6 within the UK fleet is growing every year. Um, just by way of a couple of statistics, um, 2017, 36% of the total UK fleet was Euro 6. 2019 is expected to be 50%. 2021, 64%. And by the time the, uh, the low emission zone uh, is, is due to start in Glasgow 2023, then all the indications are that 78% of the UK fleet will be Euro 6. So, clarify, just so, so I understand that as a percentage, you know, how many, how many hauliers in Scotland will, will, you know, how many trucks will be on the road in 2023 that, that won't meet that standard roughly, rather than a percentage? Well, at the minute, there are 493,600 HGVs registered, right? So, uh, that's UK. So um, if you're looking at a percentage of that, 78% of that figure. Um, okay. So uh, it's a substantial amount, but it still leaves a substantial amount that will not be ready mm. by 2023. The average life of a truck is between 10 and 12 years. And we have to remember that Euro 6 came in, was it 2013, was it, I think? Some, something along those lines. And before that, previous governments had recommended that Holliers bought Euro 5. Yeah. So they did that in good faith. And now they're being required to change it earlier than their planned schedule. So it's just to flag up that there's an economic imperative that, that, that's surrounding this as well that affects the industry. So Jamie, you want to come in with a, a, a thing, and I'll come back to just you, John. It was a brief supplementary. Thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, uh, and Mr. Kenmuir, your previous comments, uh, I found it quite intriguing, actually. We often talk about the de facto position that everyone accepts that there should be LEZ zones, and it's just an argument about the hows, the why, you know, the whats and the wheres, and how much is. Um, but you, you've brought a very different perspective to the panel for the first time, and that's that if we only target specific areas, we're not addressing the universal problem. Now, you could read that in two ways. Are you suggesting that there should be no zone anywhere, or there should be a universal zone by that? I mean, that there should be complete compliance or complete uh, the, the, the zone should not exist at all. And I think it's, it's not clear from what you said which one you prefer. Um, <clears throat> when I was reading the um, uh, part one of the uh, of the bill here, and w um, I, I got interested when it started talking about retrofitting and whether that should be allowable or not. And I, I found myself beginning to wonder why why would that be an issue for you? Why do you need to think about it? Um, I think um, the, the short answer to your question is universal. Um, I think if, um, I, I mean, I'm here to talk about the taxi fleet, so there are 1,316 of them in, um, in Edinburgh and just over 1,400 of them in Glasgow. If they're all Euro 6 or electric, what does it matter what street they're moving up and down? Um, if they've all met that standard, the, whether or not there's a low emission zone becomes moot. Mm. Um, and, and I think that if you design a little zone with a boundary around it, you're creating a whole world of complication. 
So what happens when somebody in a Glasgow taxi gets a taxi to bring them to Waverley Station in Edinburgh? Are they allowed in or are they not? And uh, you're, we're into, <coughs> unless everybody has the same standard across the whole country. I, I think um, that um, the uh, management of the environment and management of um, emissions is something that by definition is a, a, a global issue, a national issue, it's a, it's a macro issue. To try and, to, to try and manage the, uh, the climate within a few streets just seems to me completely illogical. Possibly not a popular point of view, but it just seems to add unnecessary complication. Peter, do you want to come in? Just, I, I want to follow up on that, uh, Tony. You, I mean, we all know the, the, the London black cab, they're a very long lived vehicle, they, they last for almost forever, but they've got a very old fashioned type of engine. Well, some of the older ones have. You said, you said we, we could get them all to, to, uh, to Euro 6 level. I mean, is that is that any likely to happen any time soon with the taxis? I mean, I oh, see yeah. taxis here that are 10 years old, with a with a very old type of diesel engine. So that's going to be a fairly polluting vehicle, I would have thought. You said something really interesting there when you mentioned the age of the vehicle. So there's research in the German automotive industry that shows that the emissions that are created by building car batteries take a 10 years to recoup the fuel savings that you'll make by um, uh, converting the engines. So um, if you put a, an age limit on the vehicles, and that's, that's something specific that I would like to get across, and I'm glad I've got the opportunity. I think what we want to do is manage the emissions of the vehicles, mm -hmm. not necessarily the age, mm -hmm. um, because um, a well-maintained, safe vehicle that's passing emission standards um, hopefully Gavin would agree, um, it's much more economically sound practice to keep that vehicle running than it is to scrap it and build another one to replace it. But um, in Edinburgh in particular, the City of Edinburgh Council has introduced some very aggressive targets. Um, anything older than a Euro 5 taxi in Edinburgh has to go this year. Right. So there are 1,316 taxis in Edinburgh um, and I'm not sure even the City of Edinburgh Council Licensing Committee realised that by scrapping everything that was older than Euro 5, that was nearly 700 vehicles. So half the fleet has to go in one year. Um, so will that happen by replacing the car or replacing the engine? Um, they haven't given us the option of retrofitting. Um, so um, what we can do to extend the life expectancy of the vehicle is convert it to LPG. That costs about £12,000, and we get an extra four years' life expectancy tacked on to the, the age of the vehicle, which is capped at 10 years. Um, and uh, all the Euro 5s have to go um, up. Uh, we've got until uh, March of 23 uh, for all the Euro 5s to go. So by 23, the entire taxi fleet will be Euro 6. OK. So, so I understand, to retrofit, to, to take it to Euro 6, yeah. is that an expensive...? option? Actually, no, not relatively speaking, because uh, you don't need to replace the engine. Uh, the, the change from Euro 5 to Euro 6 um, uh, is actually just ancillaries. Um, so it's a few grand. Okay. Relative to the £45,000 cost of replacing the vehicle, it's very affordable. John, you want to come back? Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, um, it's been quite wide-ranging. I wonder just to maybe expand on, on a particular point that Mr Kenmuir made, and, and it's something that's in the Friends of the Earth uh, um, evidence uh, regarding the category of special roads and the, the anomalous situation of maybe having a, a, a zone, but funnily enough, the roads which are the responsibility of the Scottish Government rather than the local authority being exempt. This is the issue of motorways and, and, and trunk roads. I wonder if the panel comment on that situation please yeah so we put in our submission that um in the current provisions of the bill that the motorways would be exempt for the many low emission zone scheme and at, at first glance that might seem like it makes sense that um motorways are treated differently for them for them inner city roads but in terms of trying to think uh, long term and for the ambition of low emission zone schemes we said in our submission that shouldn't be taken off the table just to respond to Tony's comments about certainly a, a very small low emission zone scheme wouldn't be much use. We'd want to see a, a substantial um, geographical area covered by the zones in cities. The proximity of people, particularly vulnerable groups like uh, children and, and elderly people, to uh, traffic pollution at the source. So if you're at the curbside, 
then you're um, being exposed to high levels of pollution. It means that we need to be thinking about how we um, protect high density or urban areas where there's lots of traffic and lots of people. So just one or two streets covered by a low emission zone scheme, I think we can all agree, probably wouldn't be effective or worthwhile implementing. It would be great to see the, the cities that are first earmarked for low emission zone schemes thinking, how can this apply city-wide? And so therefore, things like, in the, in the fullness of time, motorways might need to be considered. That was something that we put in our submission. Um, could I just return to a, a quick point, though, just on the uh, Euro standards, um, which we've spoken about briefly about HGVs and taxis. But something that we focused on in, in our submission was that to think in terms of how that affects private cars, right, the majority of vehicles on our roads, that um, the standards in the policy memorandum are Euro 4 petrol, which would be any car bought new from 2004, I think, onwards, and Euro 6 diesel, which would be 2014. So then if you're thinking the, the current provisions are the low emission zone schemes would be brought in in 2024 to 2026, so that would be a private car that's 22 years old or, or younger if it's petrol or 12, I don't know, if 12 years old if it's diesel, like those would be changes we'd expect to see in fleet turnover anyway, and the cars wouldn't be around on the roads for that long. So one of the questions we posed in this submission is, what is this current provision doing that the second-hand car market wouldn't do naturally anyway? That if we agreed that these low emission zones are needed, surely we agree that they should be effective. I, I, I'm just going to move on, if I may, John, to, to the next question. Richard, because I think this sort of feeds in naturally. Yes, I uh, basically, um, Tony and uh, Martin will love this uh, question. So the bill proposes that certain classes of vehicle will be banned from entering a low emission zone. Will that not disadvantage users who will then not be able to either drive into a zone via an old ta taxi or deliver goods into that zone because they are uh, they can be retrofitted, and there also would be a penalty imposed for non-compliance. And many other LEZs, for example, London, require a charge to be paid if the entry criteria was not met. So, what option would you prefer, and why? Martin, you better lead on that because. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, the points are well made. Um, <clears throat> should we go down that route? then there will be a number of vehicles that will not be allowed into uh, those areas, which will undoubtedly have an impact on service. Uh, <laughs> it will also impact on the number of small businesses who are able to access these areas. Now, deliveries must happen. Um, we, we saw during the, the bad weather at the end of February how delays for a couple of days um, meant that there was empty shelves. Uh, and, and uh, deliveries uh, that, that couldn't get through were, 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 were missed. We would urge, again, a sensible approach to this. Uh, there are low emission zones that exist across Europe that allow Euro 5 and in some Euro 4, uh, and they have reported you know, good, good results. So what we would urge is that we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater here. Uh, you mentioned London, and London's a great example because we now have a situation where you have a low emission zone, you have an ultra low emission zone, and you have the London borough of Hackney setting up their own emission zone, which is different within the emission zone. So we have to watch and we have to guard that we're not setting up uh, a, a system where that's going to be different in the various different areas uh, or, or cities that are, that are taking on the, the concept of low emission zones. The, ge the geography of Scotland means that there is a very high likelihood that uh, someone delivering to Glasgow will either deliver to Edinburgh the same day or possibly even Dundee uh, the same day. It's very unlikely they'll do all three, but it is a possibility. And it would seem ridiculous to have a vehicle that's eligible to drive into Edinburgh, but not Glasgow, Dundee, but not Edinburgh. So we have to try and guard against setting up different standards. Um, but, yeah, I, it will undoubtedly 
have an effect on the industry and who is allowed to deliver into these areas. Before we move on to possibly Tony or anyone else, I've actually read that in the likes of London, there are uh, companies who deliver outside the zones mm -hmm. and they then transfer goods onto another vehicle, which yep. then can deliver into the zone. Is that the case? Yeah, that is the case. And uh, the, the idea of distribution centres is not a new thing. Uh, I, uh, our, our members are... are paid to deliver from point A to point B. And if point B is a distribution centre, so be it. Um, we understand that in, in many cases, the, the, the trucks that are going into uh, city centres are not operating at their most efficient because of stop-start, because of uh, congestion, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one, that is one answer uh, to, to some of the, the delivery problems. But I would remind you that for every 44 tonne Arctic, it takes 28 van loads to cover that load off. I would also remind you that customer expectations are vastly different now from what they were a few years ago. You can, if you're having a glass of wine late one night, you can go onto a well-known uh, shopping site and order something from the other side of Europe, which will arrive to you the next day. And that will be done on the back of a lorry. So we have to understand that the concept of service has changed. Um, and we also have to understand that uh, even distribution centres will bring their own problems with it in terms of congestion. Even if it's el uh, electric vehicles that are taking it from the distribution centre in, then it's the added traffic that, co that, that has to be under consideration there as well. I want to come in on that. Well, means. Um, my own business has carbon neutral accreditation, so we are um, supplying cook pots in Guatemala and we're reforesting Uganda to offset our carbon emissions and, and we do that for um, as it helps us win business uh, from customers like the Parliament and RBS and so on. Um, I, I think that what's happening in our industry is that we are moving apace. Um, the standard of the vehicles is improving, they're newer, they're lower emission. Um, we're either planting trees or doing whatever else we need to do to reduce our carbon footprint. We're doing all of these things because they make economic sense for us, they make commercial sense for us. So there's lots happening in the industry that doesn't need to be, um, doesn't need to be forced on us. Um, and for me, it's, as usual, the devil's in the detail. It comes down to getting your sleeves rolled up and making sure that what's applied is logical. I think that by 2023, all of the taxis in the major cities in Scotland are going to be Euro 6 or electric or hybrid. And that's going to happen without any interference or governance. That's happening anyway. Um, but um, once you start scratching uh, a wee bit below the surface, there are things happening like in Edinburgh and Glasgow at the moment. It's OK to sell on a Euro 5 taxi or to buy a Euro 5 taxi as long as it's already in the city. But you can't import one from outside the city. So I can't buy a Euro 5 taxi from London um, although it's got lower mileage, it's creating lower emissions, the taxi is in better condition and it's costing me less. But I can buy the same vehicle in Edinburgh because it's already here. So there are things like that that, that, that really muddy the waters, where the detail gets overly complicated and, uh, and not terribly logical. Um, and I think um, that we're, we're managing our fleet anyway. Uh, Partly that's being decided by, I mean, Dundee in particular are, t are real leading lights as far as the introduction of electric vehicles into the taxi fleet are concerned, and they're worthy of a mention. But in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow, where we're talking about having um, low emission zones, the taxi fleet's going to be where it needs to be anyway. Mm. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I've got a follow-up. I also rem reminded that uh, there are 32 different councils in Scotland, and they all have 32 different ways of dealing with Taxes, I will remember that. Um, the next question I want to ask, do the, the low emission proposals in the bill strike the right balance between consistency across Scotland, which basically I think you're saying doesn't, and the ability of local authorities to devise schemes appropriate to local circumstances? And if not, what changes would you like to see made? Who, who'd like to add <laughs> off on that? <coughs> Neil. I'll just quickly come into that. Consistency is important for our members. I mean, we, we represent the private car drivers, and they don't want to have to have a different permit for going into every single 
32 council area in, in Scotland or the four cities. Um, we are already seeing this across Europe. Um, some of our uh, motoring clubs that we work with in Europe uh, put together a stunt where they stuck every single permit you needed to drive around Europe on the front of a car, 26 bits of paper you couldn't see out of the vehicle. So <laughs> it, we don't want to go down that line. We want to see consistency. Um, we also don't want to see the market distorted by, by, by early introduction of things like stopping Euro 5, because even though that would stop people going into a, a, a low emission zone, it will have a knock-on effect on the market in general. It will be very difficult to sell an old diesel, um, and that would mean <clears throat> cars might be scrapped early. People will make losses, so there will be economic impacts beyond the low emission zone as well. Um, but yes, uh, we certainly want consistency is, is the number one thing we want to see out of this. We don't want to see a different scheme in every area. Having said that, we are seeing in places like Germany, local authorities going down a line of encouraging retrofitting of Euro 5 to bring it up to Euro 6, particularly for diesels. The technology does exist. It's not that, that uh, difficult. So whilst we would like to see the same kind of sanctions, the same kind of controls being used in low emission zones, that would not stop local authorities if they wanted to perhaps funding um, a retrofit program for some of their vehicles or some of, of the vehicles in their area so you know a, a bit of flexibility in that respect but certainly the core running of a low emission zone the core way it's it's organized the core way it's enforced should be consistent across scotland for us it is, uh, Gavin. Yeah, just to come back on that point, because as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a concern that the objectives of a low emission zone scheme aren't set out in the bill. But there is a bit in the bill that says um, any penalty monies that are paid um, should be used by local authorities to further the objectives of the zone. So we don't know what the objectives are, but the local authorities will spend money on those objectives. I think that's that's a good example that we need clarity on what those objectives are. So if it's if it's just blanket reduction of air pollution, then um, funding retrofit schemes might be appropriate. If it's compliance with um, EU legislation, which uh, Scottish cities are currently breaking, then it might be a, a different approach. Um, I think there's an agreement um, among us all that a national consistency is important. Um, and that we said in our submission, um, various factors about how low emission zones operate should be reserved to the minister. Um, the hours of operation, um, the automatic number plate recognition, in other words, the, the way that the low emission zone uh, works. Also, there's this um, section about um, that a uh, local authority can suspend their low emission zone scheme for uh, events of national importance. And, but it's up to the local authority to decide what is nationally important. That seems like it would be a, more appropriate for Scottish Government Minister to decide and determine what's an, a, um, what's an event of national importance that would um, justify suspending a low emission zone scheme. Um, and just to, uh, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just because I want to see if Richard wants to follow up on that because we've got a huge amount of questions and, and, and I think some of what you're saying is going to come out. I've got the answers uh, that I'm looking for. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick question from me before we move on to the next lot of questions, which Colin, is one thing we heard when we were listening to, to uh, the situation from London is the fact that it, consensus is hugely important and getting uh, people to buy into the scheme and therefore take ownership and therefore want to be part of low emission zones. It, it strikes me, and, I, and I'm going to declare an interest because I have a, a, a vehicle that's a Euro 5, um, and, and I tell you, it won't be go on, gone before 2022 um, because it'll have to earn every mile that, that I've, I've paid for it on. You know, do you think Euro 5's keeping a vehicle at Euro 5 beyond 2022 would be that damaging? Or do you think that me, like many other people, would see that Euro 5 was what we encouraged, as Martin had suggested from the Hauliers' point of view, um, part for a slightly longer, i.e. a 10-year-old vehicle is nothing in this day and age, I, I believe. So who would like to, to comment on that? Neil. Just quickly, I don't actually have the figure to hand, but there, there, there was some research that suggested that the vast majority of the pollution is caused by a small minority of badly run vehicles, badly maintained vehicles. So our view is if you maintain the vehicle properly, you, you'll, you won't be meeting, meeting the standards of a Euro 6, obviously. You'll be meeting the standards of the time when you bought the vehicle, but it, it, will, it will be a cleaner, cleaner vehicle, and obviously using it less as well will help. But I think one of the things that we've, we find difficult is that local authorities have had the power to roadside test vehicles for many, many years, but very, very few of them, if any, do it. Mm -hmm. So you can have 
the van or the car spewing black smoke going through the city, and nobody is enforcing that. Um, the MOT uh, regulations have been tightened up only recently, and that's one of many things that are happening to improve the emissions from vehicles. But certainly, we'd like to see local authorities using some of those powers they already have to target that minority of badly maintained vehicles. So, so Euro 5 would be less of a problem, badly maintained vehicles, so as far as you're A badly going. maintained Euro 6 is going to be an issue as much as a badly maintained Euro 5. So. Tony, Tony, do you want to answer briefly on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you've echoed a point that I made earlier, that it's far more um, uh, ecologically sound to keep a well-maintained vehicle running than it is to replace it with a new one. Um, the... Um, the, uh, the licensing authorities all around Scotland all have a testing regime uh, where they bring the taxis in for annual inspection. Sometimes it's six monthly, sometimes it's even more frequent for, as vehicles get older um, and, and, they, uh, and they test their emissions. Um, I, I, I've perhaps um, naively taken it for granted, I suppose, that uh, you mentioned London. Very, very briefly, um, in London, bus usage is falling. It's tailing off. Private car ownership is tailing off. I've heard an interesting theory that that's because people find it a distraction from looking at their smartphone. Um, but, um, but what's happening is there's an exponential rise in on-demand transport, which is, which is the space that we occupy. In London in 2016, there were 6 million journeys a day in on-demand transport. And last year, there were 30 million journeys a year. It had increased by a factor of five in one year. Morgan Stanley have it that half of all demand transport will be... Um, in some form of on-demand. Uh, half of all driven miles will be in on-demand transport by 2025. Um, so our marketplace is growing exponentially. Um, and I, I guess the only issue for us is that the public hire taxi in, in any given licensing authority, the regulation might be slightly different. The licensing regime might be slightly different. But, um, and really the only issue we have is that a public hire taxi that's licensed in one area can make it in to drop off in a low emission zone in another area. As long as the public hire um, taxi has access, and it's hard to believe that anyone would rule that out, um, but as long as the public hire taxi has access and the local authorities are managing their emissions on a scale, we are happy. Martin, do you want to briefly say something on Euro 5 and Euro 6? Sure. Um, I, briefly, I have to say. I'll be as quick as, as humanly possible. Um, Euro 5 for us is not too much of an issue. Um, we, would, we understand that the need for Euro 6 is categorised as ultra-low emission. But we have the most heavily regulated industry on, on the go. We're far more heavily regulated than the aviation industry, for, for example. So we have legal requirements on the maintenance of our vehicles. We also have spot checks from DVSA. Uh, and we are under the auspices of our traffic commissioner, who, um, if you don't uphold the promises that you made on your operator's licence, and that includes environmental concerns, then you could lose your licence. There are a number of different steps a traffic commissioner can make. So um, for us, we believe, uh, we understand the, uh, the requirement for Euro 6, but it would not be a disaster for our industry should Euro 5 be considered appropriate uh, and would, it would also help a number of hauliers who are, are, are looking to uh, bridge that gap or find the difficulty in, in bridging the gap. But, uh, as I said, we, we understand the position on Euro 6. Gavin, do you want to briefly comment on, on private people with, with, with Euro 5 cars and whether they should be... But I have to ask you to be brief on it. Sure. Just... Um... As a point of clarification, you mentioned that you won't be getting rid of your car before 2022, which is great, but the low emission zone schemes, as, as they're currently drafted, wouldn't be affecting you until many years after that. I think um, what we need to keep in mind for turnover of fleet and particularly for um, people um, thinking that they need to buy a new car as we're looking quite far into the future on some of this stuff. Um, 2024 would be the earliest that a local authority would be allowed to implement a low emission zone scheme un under these provisions. So that's six years from now before they would need to look at changing their car. But another point that perhaps we haven't touched on enough yet is that in addition to uh, turnover of the fleet and, and changing their car, we need to be thinking about changing the, the mode of travel. That's why the low, low emission zones in the transport belt is so appropriate because 
low, low emission zone schemes in order to reduce air pollution we need to be moving people out of private car travel that's on to public tra public transport needs to be expanded and improved to allow people a different option so if you still have your euro 5 in 2022 that's wonderful but it would be great if there was a bus option that made any journey you were thinking about taking um, just as attractive as taking your car and, and Gavin, I, I take that point. Getting a bus from 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 rural Scotland <laughs> yeah, up in yeah. the Highlands down down into Glasgow maybe may, may be a challenge. A, a, a challenge. Um, Colin, I'm going to come on, and, I, and I'm just noting in, in my mind as well is that I'm not sure on if there's a list of exempted vehicles, but people who drive old uh, old cars. So if you've got an old Morris Minor, do they get penalised if they want to go into Glasgow? Maybe that's something we, we need to take up, or any any old car. Colin. Um. Th th thanks very much, Convener. Um, a point that, that Mr Kemier made um, earlier was the devil will be in the detail. Uh, and I suppose that's one of the big challenges we've got as a committee, that much of what how LEZs will work will be in the regulations set by the government and ministers rather than on the legislation itself. And that's obviously a challenge for us as a committee. In terms of developing the regulations uh, from the government's point of view, can I ask you if your organisations have been consulted or discussed those regulations with the government? Have they asked your views on what those detailed regulations on LEZ should say? We actually have a meeting with Transport Scotland on Friday uh, to follow up uh, on that consultation at a national level. Um, and um, there's been a great deal of consultation in Edinburgh and Glasgow with uh, the local authorities. Uh, my concern, I think it was touched on um, uh, earlier, my, uh, my concern when it comes to that, I, I took great comfort when I met with um, the City of Edinburgh Council and they couldn't tell me where the LEZ was going to be. Um, they couldn't tell me what vehicles would get in and which ones wouldn't. And they couldn't tell me when it was going to happen. And I, I took a lot of comfort from that. Um, uh, so uh, my concern is that when, uh, when a local authority is granted a power, unless, it, unless it's, they're given very specific instruction on how to use it, um, then it tends not to be applied. And so I, you know, I, I think it needs to be quite, I think it needs to be very clear and very prescriptive. But we're, we're, we're consulting with local authorities and with Transport Scotland at a national level. So we're, we're, in, we're comfortable that we're being consulted at all levels, if that answers the question. Colin, do you, do you, Anyone? If anybody else is, is that, is that be the case for all organisations? Certainly for our, our, our sorry, no. Gavin. Uh, certainly for our, for our part, then we are more than happy with the, the the way things have gone and the level of consultation that's been involved. We've met with senior ministers. We meet regularly with Transport Scotland, uh, and uh, I, as I said, I, I, I appreciate having seen what's what's going on south of the border in a lot of different. Uh, a lot of different areas. I, I very much appreciate the, the, the consultative nature of how the Scottish government's going about this. Gavin, do you want, do you want to come in? I was just going to say, I, I don't necessarily have regular meetings with ministers or um, <laughs> senior staff within um, Transport Scotland. But just to, just to expand that point, so the commitment is for low emission zones to be in place by uh, the end of 2020 in the four cities. So we're now in October 2018. So th thinking through the, the timeline for secondary legislation, not just the, the detail of it, but we'd want to be clear on when exactly after the, uh, the bill becomes an act, we'd expect to see that secondary legislation so that local authorities have time to include all stakeholders and ensure that um, they're implementing effective low emission zones. So I think the timeline of that is something to keep in mind as well. Colin. Okay. And on, on the issue of timelines, I can't want to come back to an issue that we've obviously touched on, and that is the fact that, um, that the grace period is up to six years. I get the impression there's clearly split views on the level of that grace period. Do you want to expand on what you think the grace period should be? Who'd like to head off on that? Gavin. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I, th I think just a, a general point, though, obviously um, we've spoken a bit about the, the challenges that face particular industries, and clearly they need to be supported through this transition. Um, and so uh, that might mean a different uh, grace period for different industries, or it might mean um, government support financially. But more broadly, I think looking at the entire fleet, all the, all the vehicles on the road, the current grace periods of six years is, is far too long before low emission zones are finally in place. Um, the additional years, 
that there's an option for additional years that doesn't seem necessarily justified. And I think if, if we take a national approach at communicating the need for these low emission zones to people, the, the grace periods can be surely shortened by a couple of years. Okay. Um, does, Neil? There's a, there's a need to have some form of grace period because consumers are currently quite confused. There's a lot of changes been happening in emissions and information. We've just had the whole, the, the information that's on your new car has all changed. We've now got a new uh, way of uh, assessing the CO2 and the NO2 that's on your car. That's um, real driving emissions. And that's where all the sort of diesel gate scandal came in because the figures, I mean, most of people who buy a car now, the car might say it does 50 miles per gallon. No one ever gets 50 miles per gallon out of a car. Or oh, that's the official urban uh, and, and motorway figure. And there are new set of figures coming out. So consumers are having to deal with a new MOT system, a new set of figures on their vehicle possibly that might impact on company car tax and of course they're, they're taking on Euro 6 as well at the same time and trying to understand what Euro 5 and Euro 6 is. So I think it does take time for these things to work through and as these things work through they will deliver cleaner air, air anyway because there will be more Euro 6 on. And uh, also uh, only this week for example the, the government in Westminster stopped the grant for um, hybrid vehicles. They ran out of money um, So now, and the grant has been slashed in half for electric vehicles. So when high-level things like that are happening, that again adds to confusion and, and consumers don't know what choices to make. So I think time is a, you know, allowing a lot of time is a good thing, but in some ways it's also a slightly bad thing because people are now buying their cars. Most people buy their new cars in a three or four year um, private finance plan cycle now. So they're starting to make decisions for the early 2020s on the new cars. And at the moment, they're still making decisions not to buy hybrids and electrics. So, you know, we, we need to get some consistent messages here. But certainly, uh, over time, we will see more new, more ve clean vehicles. And the more, more of those that come on the roads, the cleaner the air will get. Uh, Jamie, you want to come in? Uh, yes, thank you. I think we just need to be really careful about the language that we're using uh, in the committee, uh, there's no suggestion that there's going to be a six-year grace period. The six-year is the maximum, as the bill, as it's currently drafted, and it may not f finish like that, if you are a resident within a zone, the, uh, the minimum uh, grace period is actually one year uh, for non-residents. And given the choice, if, you, you know, if, if a local authority uh, has that choice of introducing it now or waiting four years, uh, you know, we, we don't know what they'll do. So I think it's, it's worth making that point that it is highly likely that the spending decisions of consumers and businesses now on vehicles is based on the information that they have. If we're being told that that information is patchy and sketchy at the moment, but those, those zones could actually be in place by 2021, not 2025, as, as Mr. Thompson suggests, then I'd be inclined to be quite worried that we're not actually uh, giving out enough detailed information to businesses and consumers. Would anyone agree or disagree? Uh, Tony, you nodded. Yes, I did. Um, I'm in a slightly strange position where the, uh, the target's already set in Edinburgh and Glasgow probably have the fleet where it needs to be ahead of time. Um, so it's, it's done already, but the debate that we had at that level was, um, was, was very aggressive. And uh, so uh, I mentioned earlier in Edinburgh, we're having to replace half of our fleet um, in this coming year. Um, and, um, um, and we put a number of questions to the licensing authority. You know, have you considered are that number of vehicles available to buy? Um, and there's, there's one thing I want to very quickly touch on because the taxi trade is unlikely to receive any form of subsidy. We've had access to finance through the Energy Savings Trust. And um, what they've done is they've put the finance um, in place for people who currently have the oldest vehicles. So it started with if your taxi was more than 10 years old, you could get an interest-free loan to buy a new one. And that's completely wrong, completely wrong. What you need is uh, to create a food chain. Uh, it'll be the same for HGVs and other vehicles. There has to be a food chain. Um, an owner-operator who's keeping his vehicle running around the clock and he's part of one of the big radio companies and his cost base is very high, he finances brand new vehicles, depreciates them over three to five years, and sells them on. He has to sell them on so that he gets some return, some residual value to finance the new vehicle. So the person that you want to give the finance to is the one with the newest vehicle because you want them to keep changing it and you want their vehicles to make their way down the food chain and create that second-hand market. Um, you're not going to get into that kind of detail here, and I don't want to confuse you, but 
Um, I, I just want to illustrate that very often the money isn't put in the right place. It, it's, we're, we're not thinking a couple of steps ahead to how the economy really works with these vehicles. Um, and um, those considerations at the moment, I don't think, are part of the equation. Okay, and uh, actually, because we're short of time, I, I, I think it's an interesting point you raised. So we may come back to that later. Peter, could you just go with your next lot of questions? Well, I mean, you, you just lead very nicely into my next question. We've heard about how the changes to vehicles are necessary and the costs that that incurs. What, if any, financial support should be offered to vehicle owners living or working within an LEZ, LEZ to replace or upgrade non-compliant vehicles? Um, difficult question. Who would mm. like to head off on that? Um, Tony, you? <laughs> Sorry? Well, I put a number on it. <laughs> no, I, think you've, I think your position is clear from your previous comment. I mean, Neil, do you want to, to come in on that? We, we did, uh, the survey we did on this, um, amongst private car drivers, the most popular option was to subsidise better buses, vans and lorries. But that's, that's kind of this them and us, you know, the private cars versus the larger vehicles. But that certainly uh, there's a perception out there that the buses and the lorries and the, and the, the vans are the main issue. Therefore, for amongst private car people, they would like to see the money targeted on, on those vehicles first. Uh, I can't put any figures on that as to what you would need to give to people. But certainly, you know, as I say, if, if you have that clarity, if people know the timescales and so on, that will help. And it will help to the market to stabilise. I mean, it's a very difficult market for second-hand vehicles at the moment in terms of electric vehicles because there's so few. Um, I mean, I, I, if I can quote a, a figure I got from the RAC just yesterday on the RAC report on motoring this year, uh, they, they asked Scots what their next choice of vehicle would be. 17% chose a diesel, 54% a petrol, 14% a, a conventional hybrid, 6% a plug-in hybrid, but only 2% a pure electric vehicle. So people are still not thinking about the most environmentally friendly vehicles yet. Um, so that situation does need to change and, and incentives will help that. But getting the incentives in the right place and to the right people is quite a challenge. We were quite, on the face of it, a diesel scrappage scheme was something we thought was great. But uh, analysis of that has shown that that doesn't necessarily deliver uh, what you want either. So you have to be very careful where the money is targeted. But as I say, we need to have consistent messaging and consistent um, messaging about the money because, as I say, as I mentioned before, the grants suddenly stop. That distorts the market. But in general terms, amongst private car motorists, they would like to see money spent on the larger vehicles rather than on their vehicles. So all the money to lorries, Martin. That's a wonderful <laughs> idea. <laughs> but, um, the, uh, I mentioned before that, although technically there is no retrofit option that's approved just now, uh, Green Urban have indicated that, depending on the engine size, a uh, retrofit option for HCV would run between £11,000 and £25,000, which is a, it's a fairly substantial uh, uh, investment. But what, just a bit of context um, to, to let you understand how the, the, the industry has, has, has um, been let down in the past is uh, some of you may or may not know that there's currently a class action uh, being brought against the truck manufacturers. They were found uh, guilty of uh, price fixing uh, over the period 1997 to 2011. Uh, and part of the argument, uh, although I'm, I'm, I'm not going to divulge too much on this because of the, 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 uh, the, the, there's a, an appeal in it, the, the, the uh, Competitions Appeal, uh, Com Compensation Appeals Tribunal, sorry, the CAT. Um, but part of that argument is about the delay or uh, the price fixing of Euro 6 technologies and the delay of implementing it. So. Right from the start, even though Euro 6, the, the, the truck manufacturers had the Euro 6 technology, they delayed bringing it into the industry so they could get rid of their Euro 5's stock. So we've been stymied at the start of this, and now uh, the knock-on effect is that we're not as far ahead as we should be. Um, it's, we, we were having a chat outside there, and it's much easier to bring an industry uh, to a point where you want them to be um, by helping them rather than dragging them kicking and screaming. Uh, and although we would, we would love a scrappage scheme, we realise that that's very unlikely to happen. But certainly some form of uh, help in the, in the form of a grant for particularly SMEs uh, to, to upgrade uh, and bridge the gap between Euro 5 and Euro 6. Because we're not only now at the point over the last year or so where we're seeing second-hand Euro 6 entering the market, where the bigger guys are now moving on. And back, but you, you have no option. You cannot buy anything other than a Euro 6 engine now. Perfect. Peter, could you just go with your... You've got a yeah. follow... 
Yeah, I, yeah I, would I, would just, I would just caution, uh, you know, that there certainly won't be a bottomless bit of money to help this process to happen, so I think you need to be fairly cautious. My next question is about the automatic number plate recognition. recognition. Do you have any concerns about ANPR camera enforcement? and any suggestions as to how these concerns could be addressed. I did read in, in the, your the, the Rod Hollage guys that there were concerns about foreign trucks and how they would be policed. Can yeah. Martin maybe kick off? The issues with, uh, with foreign trucks, and, uh, but who knows, maybe Brexit will sort that out. But uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and find out. But our main, <laughs> our main concern uh, surrounding uh, uh, automatic number plate recognitions is the amount of private plates that are in our industry, uh, and those private plates get moved around the fleet. So uh, it would be fairly easy to assume that a truck is older than it is because of the number plate that's on it through this, the, this system. So mm -hmm. it's not flawless. Uh, AM, uh, automatic number plate recognition is a good thing, uh, particularly when it comes to compliance. We see it on the bridges, etc., and we, we deal with uh, Transport Scotland a lot on, on the findings from there and the education process. But for this situation, it's not without its problems for our industry there. Do you feel that the, the, the foreign trucks will be, will be registered on the system and will, will anybody know what the, how old a foreign truck is, for mm, instance? No. No? That won't, that won't no. register? Uh, okay. they're, they're, they're licensed in another country, so uh, mm. unless you're accessing that information, then... No. But, Anyone else want to comment on, on that? I think, you know, camera use is necessarily universally popular, but it certainly works now for the private cars. It, it's running everything. So uh, I think you know, it, it, it does require that you have an appeals process, which can add to cost and so on. But we have an appeals process for parking, for bus lane enforcement, which is working OK at the moment. So do, you, do you feel that the, the, the private plate issue that Martin mentioned is an it issue for it, private for car, cars it, for as well? Car, for, in, my, in my experience, for cars, it shouldn't be an issue because a private plate will still be linked to your V5, which will have your Euro standard on it and should be able to the, the databases should all talk to each other. Uh, at the moment, they only tend to issue things like addresses and so on for mm. fines, but if, if they can be linked to the emissions which are all in documents, it should be okay. I think the, 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 one of the issues we've, we've heard before is the cost of the AMPR system and, and putting it in places around low emission zones. London was okay because it, it, it was tied in with congestion charging, but we haven't heard any pricing for AMPR cameras around low emission zones. I mean, it, it wouldn't be insubstantial if they were going to be static cameras. And, and there was some feeling, certainly from London, that the costs wouldn't, uh, the fines wouldn't uh, cover the costs of, of, of implementing it. So maybe that's something that, that we need to consider on more. John, you had some questions as well. Yeah, well, it was really just a couple of points. I'll roll them into one a, based on the submission from the Road Haulage Association. So the others might want to comment, but it's kind of aimed at yourself. Really, for clarification, I think for myself, uh, uh, one point you'd raised was that, um, in the worst case, a haulier failing to comply with an LEZ could find themselves being brought to the attention of the Traffic Commissioner. We believe this would be overly punitive for what would be a minor transgression. So I was wondering if you could just explain that. Yes. And, and uh, well, I'll, give you, I'll give the other point as okay. well, which is uh, Glasgow will not have the infrastructure to properly enforce its LEZ until 2023 meaning the bus fleet will be unaffected by an LEZ, but the haulage industry will have to, will be penalised immediately, and I didn't understand that point either. OK, two points. Firstly, um, this has been a learning curve for us as well. So the point that was made in there about the traffic commissioner's uh, office, we actually went and contacted uh, Richard Turfett, the <coughs> senior traffic commissioner, to find out whether... As I mentioned before, the promises you make on your own licence application does include environmental promises. But they have come back to us and said that, for example, if you are driving an eligible vehicle into a low emission zone, they will not be looking uh, at that as a serious enough offence to jeopardise your, uh, your operator's licence. Whereas uh, tipping hazardous material within your yard definitely is. So that side of the scale, we, when, when we were replying to this, we have subsequently done follow-up work. So you've is, had kind of reassurance on that? We've got reassurance right, on okay. that, that right. that is not going to be the case. OK. Um, regarding the other point, um, what our, our point was largely around... There's, there's, there's two sides to this. Um, 
Firstly, is, is surrounding the retrofit. So the, the bus industry will have had four years of having an active retrofit system to bring them in place. Whereas 2023 is coming around very, very quickly, we have no retrofit option as of yet. But also, the buses have known what standard is going to be required as well. Now, we haven't had any word from any of the local authorities as to what standard we will be asked to operate to. So the longer that goes on, the less time we have to adapt to what the standard that they're going to... Right, we're all assuming it's Euro 6, but we've had no clarification of that. So the buses have had that clarification, so they're in a position to get their house in order for a longer period of time, whereas we don't have that luxury and we're only making assumptions. Right, so it, it, it's around the detail of preparing for this rather than one's going to be enforced and one's not going to be enforced. That's right, yeah. Well, right. but we did, we did hear um, reports. Now, I, I'm not going to pass the buck. There was other people consulted on this. Uh, but we did hear it from uh, Glasgow Council that they are not confident of being able to have the enforcement side of things ready by 2023 to, to, uh, to measure the buses. And that may be along the lines of the... But the, the measuring buses, would it not just be the same equipment for measuring the... It should be. So it's haulage. an equipment issue as much as anything yes. else. So it would, and it would affect the buses and the haulage yeah, evenly? Absolutely, yeah, that's how, yeah. OK, well, that helps clarify yeah. it. Thanks very much. Uh, other questions? OK, um, next question. Mike is here. Thank you, convener. I've got two questions. My first question is, well, first of all, can I preface it by saying... The current law, as it stands, prevents anyone driving on footways, on pavements. So do you support, in principle, in this bill, there are prohibitions on pavement parking and double parking? Um, yeah. Martin. Take that one first. Uh, in principle, yes, we do. We absolutely support it. We, we don't see any uh, issue with that. The, the one thing that we would, would point out is that there are certain occasions uh, when making deliveries that uh, trucks find it almost essential to, to, to go onto the pavement so as not to obstruct the, the traffic because of the size of the vehicle itself. So that's breaking the law currently? Current, yeah, but, but there are no um, current... Uh, and, and a lot of cases, there, there's no delivery point for in order them, for them to do that. So if the shop is wanting a delivery, then that's the case. Another example would be um, when you're delivering to building sites. Now, Quite often, if you're delivering to the building site for the first time, you don't know what is going on in that building site. So the, the, the normal practice would be to park up outside and walk in on foot to see what it is you're driving into. You might not have room to reverse, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, in principle, we, we've got no issue with that. We, but, uh, again, there are issues. There, there are occasions where, we, for, our, for our guys, there's very little alternative other than blocking up the highway to do a delivery. Neil. We have taken the fairly simple view that, that, that we don't like a sort of blanket ban approach. Uh, there should be remain local flexibility. I mean, clearly we don't condone illegal driving. I mean, advanced drivers don't do illegal things, but sometimes they do. Um, but there, there are certain areas in Scotland where parking on the pavement is, is, is actually almost a necessity. It's encouraged by some local authorities. Um, I did a piece with the BBC recently where we quite quickly found a place in the west of west end of Glasgow where the, the road is marked out for parking on the pavement in order to allow the access uh, to and from of other vehicles. And other people do it because they know it. I don't believe there are thousands and thousands of Scottish drivers deliberately parking on the pavement in order to block uh, pedestrians. They all become pedestrians themselves when they get out of the vehicle. Um, but I, I, do, I do worry that there might be unintended consequences of a blanket ban approach um, in, in smaller towns, in, in the suburbs, for example, um, and it should be a local case by case basis. If there's an issue, then then enforce it. And of course the other issue is, is enforcement. I mean if it's going to be unenforceable it'll be ignored anyway, which we see anyway with a lot of our parking regulations. So it's it's the blanket ban approach um, idea part of it that we have um, objected to uh, rather than the actual concept. Gavin, do you want to say anything on that? Um, yeah I would just say <clears throat> excuse me if there were a representative from an act of travel organisation here, I'm sure that they would make the point that um, improving the pedestrian environment goes hand in hand with tackling air pollution. Um, and I guess that's how we could see pavement parking, up, uh, restricting pavement parking in the low emission zones as, as being tied together. Um, certainly support it in principle as, um, as uh, prioritising the pedestrian um, in, the, in the street environment. Just by way of example, uh, how, how without this, there would be great difficulty in delivering to concert venues 
um, music halls, you know, music halls, <laughs> that dates me a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, so things like that where access to these buildings is not necessarily from, from a road, um, then it becomes an issue for deliveries. Mike, do you want to just follow up on yes, that? Yes, I would follow up. I, I know my question was a bit of blanket ban, but in the bill there are exemptions that councils are going to be given uh, in certain parking areas and residential streets, as long as there is a... The whole point about the bill is to ensure that there is going to be safe passage for pedestrians, mm -hmm. but particularly also for people who are, uh, are disabled or, uh, ha or, or need a vehicle to, be, to go on the path. The issue is, I think, if I could just address the Road Haulage Association here, I mean, I, I've been particularly conscious of the fact that um, people have noticed that there are objections to the, in the bill, the exemption in the bill, which allows or will allow people to park on the pavement for up to 20 minutes. And our concern is that, um, several people's concern is that that allowance of parking up to 20 minutes becomes the norm, that it will allow somebody to park for 20 minutes and obstruct a pavement. Um, what would you, and particularly the Road Haulage Association, I mean, if, an, if, an, if the law was changed to allow that for 20 minutes, as long as there was a specific wide gap for the disabled, or would that be an appropriate compromise, do you think? If, if there's a facility to not use the pavement at all, then, we would, mm -hmm. then our guys would happily utilise that. As for the 20 minutes, there are some deliveries that cannot be done in 20 minutes, so which becomes problematic. Uh, particularly if you are moving, uh, like for example, if you get a, 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 an order from B and Q or something like that, then the driver will have to, in what's in, in common parlance, is called handballing, which means that they will physically have to take whatever you've, you've ordered, and it might be take it off an uneven road onto a pavement up a driveway to somebody's house. Now, it's very difficult to do that in 20 minutes, and it would be very difficult to do it either without blocking a street or by But the, but the whole point of this section of the bill is to free up the pavements for pavement users. Mm. And, and what you seem to be saying is that that won't happen with this 20 minutes. I'm saying that, uh, in principle, we're more than happy with that. We don't want to park on pavements, but there are, mm. there are deliveries where it's not possible to do anything other than that. So the 20 minutes um, should be more than enough for most deliveries, but there are deliveries that will not be able to be completed in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You just said at the beginning, when you, when you first answered my first question, actually, that the law is broken at the moment. Mm. Um, do you think this is an enforceable law? I, I think parking is a, is a, a massive issue right across the country. Um, the, I'll, I'll explain in two levels. Firstly, when urban planners or, or, or planning authorities are looking to build shopping centres or, or whatever, or anything in town, then they very rarely factor in loading bays. Um, shops have to have their equipment. Houses have to have their deliveries. Um, but they're never factored in because space is such a priority. Um, if I flip back, I mentioned earlier about the, the bad weather in February. We had, our industry was vilified um, for making deliveries in, in, in the snow. And there were countless shouts of, they shouldn't be on the road. Well, where else are they meant to go once they're on the road? Sometimes these guys are not making drops from a depot that's local. In many cases, and certainly the ones that were called out by the First Minister, there was companies from the south of England who were on day three or day four of a tramp around the UK and so f could not possibly get back to their depot while the weather was on. But there is no parking facility off-road. And we're finding this right across, not just Scotland, this is right across the UK. People seem to imagine that deliveries just happen magically by elves and they're dropped off. It's not the case. There's practicalities that are involved in you getting your deliveries, you getting your furniture, old people getting their food and medicine, chemists getting their, 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 uh, their equipment. All these things take a delivery, and there are very, and more, in a lot of cases, there is no provision made for that delivery to happen. I'm, I'm going to bring John in briefly and then come to Maureen for the final question. Yeah, thanks, Convener. It, it was really to pick up on something Mr. Gregg said. I mean, I've got some sympathy that. Actually, in some cases, it's considerate drivers who are putting two wheels on the pavement and therefore not blocking it for Mr Reid's uh, drivers. Um, I mean, do you think, have you picked up at all that councils are going to go for, you know, quite a lot of exemptions? Uh, I've started a list in my own constituency. I'm at 20. I think I'll get to about 100 streets where I think there should be uh, wheels on the pavements. 
Um, do you think councils are going to do that? Have they got the resources in the finance part of the bill? Or should it be the other way around, are you saying, that they should uh, only have, have to mark specific streets where you're not allowed to put wheels on the pavement? I, I don't have that data. We, we just don't collect that data. I've had no feedback from our members in Scotland uh, consider, you know, that they were, if they were interested in their particular streets, so I, I can't answer that question. Uh, I think it, it could work either way. I mean, if, if the councils are willing to use that flexibility, then we would be perhaps less dogmatic about our blanket approach uh, views. Um, certainly, I, I think there needs to be flexibility in the bill. That's the key thing, so that there will be, there will be roads where it does work. And it is, it, as you say, it, it, it's often... Drivers are often like sheep, you know, one, one or two neighbours do it and then everybody does it along the street and, and the, the one who doesn't then becomes vilified because he's actually sticking to the law and, and, and parking with four wheels on the road. So um, I, I think you need to give, be aware of that sort of local community feedback and I think if there was some sort of mechanism for that kind of detail, and it is the detail, it's going to be the detail of street by street that actually causes people hassle. So if, there, if that was part of the bill, if local authorities were encouraged to do that, then certainly that would be something we would, we would welcome. OK, thanks. OK, um, Tony, I'm sorry, I'm not going to bring you in on, on double parking because we know taxis never do it, but Maureen's got the last question. Yeah, I'd just like to hope that M Mr Reid wasn't suggesting that uh, vehicles shouldn't be exempt from uh, severe weather warnings. There's plenty of places to park up if there's severe weather warnings. Um, in terms of this bill, I mean, it's got to be seen in the round in terms of other things like active travel and everything. And it's not just a case of getting out in your car and a single pedestrian going along a pavement. It's pavement should, in my view, be wide enough to let double buggies and disabled um, buggies crop park, uh, pass each other. Mm. Um, and one of the things that has bothered me and been brought up by my constituents is the parking in front of dropped curbs which is a real uh, issue uh, in terms of um, vehicles uh, loading and offloading. But much of what we're discussing today will be um, eventually uh, set out in a parking standards document um, by, by the government. So um, can I ask if your organisations have already been involved in the drawing up and the drafting of such a doc document or expect to be? And we'll go right the way down the line on that. And if I could ask you to keep your answers short. Um, Martin, do you want to start that off, uh, parking standards? Yeah, um, we have had discussions uh, in this area. As I said, we, we're not militant about this in any way. We understand that, that you know there has to be access and egress. And you know, we're not going to um, you know, put up a protest about that. It's common sense as far as we are aware, and there will be bad practice in, uh, in many cases. But, uh, yeah, so we, we uh, are involved, and we would hope that we will be continued to be involved as the process carries through. Gavin? Um, no, we haven't been involved, uh, um, uh, to my knowledge. I would just encourage the committee to read the section of our submission on workplace parking levy, which talks about how um, parking can be used to support um, other areas covered by the bill, low emission zones and, and public transport. Tony? We understand the principles of the conflict for space. Everybody thinks they're, they're a priority. Um, and um, we, um, we have a lot of um, uh, debate with um, licensing authorities over the provision for uh, taxi ranking spaces. Uh, etc. But we haven't been part of any formal consultation on parking standards. Neil, um, by pure coincidence, Transport Scotland have invited me to a parking standards meeting, along with many, many others, including a range of local authorities, on the 14th of November. I believe it's been pushed back into December, but they are actively bringing together people to look at parking standards. Oh, thank you. Um, you okay. Um, Thank you. That concludes uh, your evidence session. Normally, I would now suspend the meeting to allow you to, to leave, but we have one other item that we are going to do in public, so I'm going to move on with that, so I'd ask you to remain in your seats. And that is, we're going to move on, therefore, to agenda item four, which is the consideration of support, subordinate legislation. There are uh, five negative instruments as set out in the agenda. Three instruments introduce a decriminalised parking regime within the full council area. 20 Sc uh, Scottish local authorities have already introduced decriminalised parking regimes. The remaining two instruments cover issues relating to plants in respect of pests and red plant weevil. 
and no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments. Is the committee agreed, therefore, it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to these instruments? Amen. That is agreed. Uh, the committee will now move into private session. And before we do, I'd like to thank the witnesses for the time that they've given to the committee uh, this morning. So we're now moving into private. I would ask committee members to stay in their seats and the witnesses to leave as quickly as possible. Thank you.